Because I think one of the biggest challenges we have right now is definitely having people, first of all, understanding the NFTs. And as well, the number of people using NFTs is still very small. It's only around two, three million people. And most of the people actually on the top edge um, um, are managing substantial money, but in, in the low, I would say the majority is very small. So the adoption is still very small, actually the adoption of the entire blockchain. So can you tell us, and I think your solution in HK's is really to democratize a bit like PayPal did in the beginning of the internet, that it was an email that actually could be used to open this. So tell us the parallels about this. And as well, from your generation perspective as well, someone that is quite young, that is much more digital savvy, how people can use this in a better way. Because one of the things I try to do here is democratize these things. But unfortunately, from the theory to the practice, we are actually still the, the top of the iceberg. So if the rest of the iceberg is very far from, from understanding these concepts. Exactly. So it's a very interesting thing you mentioned, right? That there are very few people today who have actually ever owned or used or even seen an NFT. But on the contrary, there are so many people today that have or own an asset that can be categorized as an NFT. Things like driver's licenses, things like birth certificates, things like, you know, company loyalty cards and loyalty programs, things like club memberships or student ID cards. All of these things technically satisfy the definition of an, of an NFT. It's just that they aren't on Web3. They're in the real world, or they're on Web2, and they're digitally stored. Now, the thing about them being digitally stored is that all the data and all the verification is in a centralized server or in a centralized backend system. If you could put this into Web3, you can make it immutable, and you can make it way more secure. So there's definitely a case to be made for having these things into Web3. But the moment you make it such that the only way your end user can interact with these assets is through Web3, you're losing the customer because people are extremely averse to adopting new technologies on their own. So what? So the only way that this will start getting traction is that, of, of course, people have very quickly started understanding the merits of using Web3, but that does not mean the users should have to interact with it themselves. So if you look at how PayPal works, right? PayPal essentially creates an email authentication system that then lets you connect your credit card and then make bank transfers. And not too many people are exactly aware of how a credit card transfer is being debited to someone else's bank account. That's not something we can do ourselves. We know that PayPal has that technology figured out and we use a very simple UI, which is what we're used to in our everyday lives. So the goal with us is to make an asset that's backed on Web3, justify it being backed on Web3 because it's immutable, it's increasingly more secure and it's something that's open source. So it's a lot more secure and impervious to any kind of attack or data manipulation. Even though it makes sense to have it there, I don't think it makes sense for your end customer to have to understand these things un un unnecessarily or have to engage with these things on a more one-to-one -one level. You, you need like an intermediate layer that softens the blow for mm -hmm. someone. I want to I wanna talk right now in terms of uh, the democratization of NFTs, especially in your generation. So I, I have, uh, um, of course, a lot of people in your age that I see that are consum consuming NFTs. Actually, a lot in India, but for instance, the crypto situation is still very sensitive and the gas feeds. So what is your experience from your generation perspective and as well from the group of people that you have involved? How do you tackle the gas fees? And for instance, things like OpenSea, 70% of NFTs are fake or different parts. So, and of course we have the Ethereum merger, but I don't want to make this interview outdated. So um, a bit, how do you see these different trends a bit bigger uh, and how you suggest some solutions besides, of course, what you're doing and in the context of what you're doing? Right, absolutely. So. Um, usually on the case of gas and network fees, it's a responsibility of the products or the projects to try and solve that problem for their consumers because you don't want to overwork the network. That being said, you still want to achieve a point where a lot of people geographically will be active at, at around that point. So it's a very fine balance to hit. But personally, the way or rather what my approach has been to getting into NFT projects is that I always focus very much on the roadmap and very much on the team. The two things that matter to me in an NFT project is what they want to do and whether the team that is promising this is capable of delivering it or not. The reason why that's super important is because it's it's a very well-known fact that a lot of NFT projects are about show and hype. And there's nothing wrong with that because at the end of the day, a lot of brands are about that as well. However, you need to know that the people working behind it, the people conceptualizing this, understand the ethos that you want to believe in and want to build that out organically. And doing that amount of due diligence generally takes a lot of time because there's a lot of fluff, so to speak, that you need to go through, which is 
prevalent in every project. I mean, a project would not be successful if they didn't at least upsell or overpromise a little bit, which is quite understandable. But making that effort, trying to understand the ethos of the people that are working behind, why they want to do what they do, actually spending the man hours of attending Twitter spaces, attending AMAs, seeing what kind of answers that they're giving, seeing how their team is composed of, how long these people have been working together, what they want to achieve, what their previous experiences are, how they see this whole thing shaping out. It only puts things into perspective and basically puts you in a situation where you're starting to understand whether you want to be involved in this journey or not, because definitely plans change, things change as you go ahead, more and more information comes to the surface, you can take better decisions accordingly. And that you have to trust the team behind the project to be able to make the smart choice and deliver accordingly, which is what I like.